Good morning. It's great to be with you again as we come together to worship God this morning. Uh, it was a lovely sunny day yesterday here in Deal, and it's a lovely sunny morning this morning. Um, so wherever you are, I hope you've been able to enjoy it somehow. And uh, for those of you who are still enjoying the half term break, I hope today is another good day for you. Um, if this is your first time of joining us, a uh, very special welcome to you. Uh, thanks so much for being with us. Um, I'm Chris, Chris Spencer, one of the senior ministers here at uh, St George's in Deal. Uh, so big welcome to everyone who's joined us this morning. Um, I'd love to encourage you to say hello in the chat if you would, because it's great to know who's around uh, and to encourage one another by knowing that other people are coming together. Uh, and uh, if at some stage you just want to like what we're doing, uh, that uh, they'd say helps us. Um, now, I don't know about you, I, I really value connecting with each other as we gather in our homes for worship uh, Sunday by Sunday. Uh, I mean, I know it helps me anchor the passing of time and, and marking Sunday out as a different day. And it's a reminder that we're connected to one another, which is really important. Um, but I also know there's something deeper going on in actually making the time to worship God and get my perspective restored. Um, I need reminding the whole of life is ultimately about him, not about me. And that when I offer myself to him again, I'm finding my right place in a world that sometimes feels it's all over the place. And that coming in worship always starts with thanksgiving. Um, as we acknowledge that everything we have comes from God and that he can always be trusted. Uh, when Solomon was dedicating the temple in the Old Testament story, um, the, 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 the song of worship they sang was simply this, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, his love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good, his love endures forever. So as we come to worship this morning, can we just take a moment to turn our hearts towards our loving Heavenly Father and to give him thanks for something in particular? Uh, something about who he is, something about what he's given us in Jesus, and something about the blessings that sustain us day by day. Just take a moment to think about that and in the quietness say, thank you, Lord, for those things. And so as we come together to worship our wonderful God, our loving Heavenly Father, let's use a prayer which some of us uh, may well know uh, and which we can say together. And Malta's going to put it up on the screen with me. Father God, we thank you for this new day. We thank you for one another. We thank you for Jesus. May we know his presence with us now as we come in worship and honour of his name. Amen. So as we come in worship, what's going to be happening? Well, Rob is going to be opening up uh, a little bit more of Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians this morning. Uh, Lisa's going to lead us in prayer. We've got a bit of feedback from the team who attended the Kairos Connection Learning Community this week. And uh, Joy and Washi and Susia and uh, Suja and Gabriella Page are leading us in worship. So lots to look forward to. But first of all, here's Grace with one of those stories that Jesus told that's really important. Hey there, everyone. I hope you're well and having a good week. Today, we're going to look at the parable of the unforgiving servant which you can find in Matthew chapter 18. Now I've got a children's Bible here, so I thought I'd just read it to you from this Bible, but do feel free to have a look in your own. Here we go. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, when my brother sins against me, how many times must I forgive him? Should I forgive him as many as seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, you must forgive him more than seven times. You must forgive him even if he does wrong to you 77 times. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who decided to collect money his servants owed him. So the king, 
began to collect his money. One servant owed him several million pounds. But the servant did not have enough money to pay his master, the king. So the master ordered that everything the servant owned should be sold, even the servant's wife and children. The money would be used to pay the king what the servant owed. But the servant fell on his knees and begged, Be patient with me. I will pay you everything I owe. The master felt sorry for his servant. So the master told the servant he did not have to pay. He let the servant go free. Later, that same servant found another servant who owed him a few pounds. The servant grabbed the other servant around the neck and said, Pay me the money you owe me. The other servant fell on his knees and begged him, Be patient with me. I will pay you everything I owe. But the first servant refused to be patient. He threw the other servant into prison until he could pay everything he owed. All the other servants saw what happened. They were very sorry, so they went and told their master all that had happened. Then the master called his servant in and said, You evil servant! You begged me to forget what you owed, so I told you that you did not have to pay anything. I had mercy on you. You should have had that same mercy on that other servant. The master was very angry, and he put the servant in prison to be punished. The servant had to stay in prison until he could pay everything that he owed. Let's have a little think about what God's forgiveness is like. I don't know if you've ever had to forgive someone for something before, whether it's at school or at work. Maybe someone said or did something that just really hurt your feelings or that made your life a bit more difficult that day. Forgiving is not easy. But to have a think about God's forgiveness for us, I'm going to use the, these things. I've got some paper, a whiteboard, a pencil, a marker pen and a rubber. Now, first of all, let's have a look at this pencil and this paper. Now, we know that everyone makes mistakes. Sometimes, without meaning to, all of us just make a bit of a mess of things. Can you see the pencil on here? And without realising it, sometimes we then go and make things worse. Or we can't stop ourselves, or we refuse to say sorry, or we get angry, or we just ugh, keep getting things wrong like this. Here we go. The mess can be quite big to clear. We can try and use something like a rubber to clear it. So that's what I'm going to try and do now. We can try and get rid of quite a lot of the mess. We can say sorry to people. We can try and do the best that we can to fix a broken situation. But just like we see with this rubber, even when we've managed to repair things considerably, considerably, there's still a bit of a smudge left. We can't always completely get rid of all the mess that we've made. It still lives with us. Hmm. But God's forgiveness isn't quite like that. There's not a mark left. In fact, God's forgiveness is more like this. We might make a mess. We might do things and get things wrong. Make a big mess and keep making a big mess. Here's my mess here. But God's forgiveness is like with a whiteboard, where with a simple wipe of a tissue, simple wipe of a tissue, everything is made clean. It's completely renewed. You'd never see that there are any marks something that happened before and in fact we end up making a mess again and God forgives us and again and again but still God in all of his mercy and all of his love he forgives us wipes this slate clean so that we are restored and made anew now I think that's a little bit what happened in the parable that we just heard about the master, or the very, very rich man, he's a bit like God. And he forgave one of his servants for a huge, huge, huge debt, or basically like a, um, a big sum of money that he couldn't pay. He said, you know what? I know you can't pay that. I'm going to pay it for you. I'm going to forget all about it. I forgive you, even though you owe me lots of money. I'm going to let it go. Done. But then that same servant, when he went out and left the king, he met another servant who 
who owed him a tiny amount of money, you know, something like £10 or £20, maybe a bit more, maybe 60 70 But he got so angry at that other servant and decided to make his life miserable, which seems a bit unfair considering how much the rich king had forgiven him. Now, there's a lot to think about in that parable. And sometimes I find myself actually feeling sorry for that very first servant who was forgiven by the king, who then got it wrong again and was unfair to someone else who failed to forgive another servant and who ended up in jail. And you might think, why feel sorry for him? Well, the reason is, is that I think maybe he didn't realise quite how much he'd been forgiven. He didn't realise that the king had truly wiped his slate clean. Maybe he didn't quite appreciate the love and mercy that he'd been shown by that king. And I think it's a little bit sometimes how we are, that we don't appreciate how much mercy and love God has shown us. How we are so forgiven, how we have had our slate cleaned, how we've been restored and redeemed. Because I think if we truly did, if we knew how much God loved us, how much God was willing and able to forget about everything that we've done without any mess like this just having everything clean and forgotten about i think if we truly knew that then we would have no option but to then make sure that we treated other people with the same love and kindness and respect and forgiveness because we would know that as we have been so forgiven there's no other option than to forgive others because that love and that mercy that we've been shown is just so fantastic that We've got to show it to others. I think we're all going to make mistakes. We're still going to find that sometimes we forget the mercy that God has shown us and that we get angry at others. But this week, I encourage you, try to remember that your slate has been wiped totally clean. And because of that, that you can show all the love and forgiveness and mercy to anyone who upsets you a little bit this week. It doesn't mean saying that you don't care. It doesn't mean being... Uh, a walkover or a pushover or saying that what happened didn't matter but with God's strength you can let it go and you can wipe the slate clean because God has so forgiven you too have a great week everyone bye
Kairos Connection, or KX as it's known, is a network of leaders and a family of churches. It's a family of churches that have committed to travel together on a journey of mission and discipleship. Um, we as a church have been part of KX for quite a number of years. It's a network that has helped us develop our thinking in terms of what God is calling us to as a church. And as a KX church, our leadership team and staff are part of a six monthly community of practice. They're a little bit like our learning communities, but engaging with the vision of the whole church. And a couple of weeks ago, six of us from the St George's team gathered with about 20 other church teams, facilitated by uh, Nick Harding as KX leader. Each community of practice has a focus, and the focus of this one was microplanting, releasing a movement of multiplying missional expressions of church. And we had three speakers who all shared their insights from their thinking or experience they'd had of planting smaller new expressions of church with mission at the heart. So we have Brian Sanders, who's written a book called Micro Churches. We had Peter Dunn, who's worked in India and seen hundreds of micro churches planted and multiplied in that context, uh, and is now seeing some of that work here. And we had Mike Moyner, who is director on the National Fresh Expressions team and a friend of Chris and myself. And there was so much uh, we came out of this with, so we're sharing just one or two snippets that we picked up that encouraged us. But before that, a very short video giving the simple overall picture of what we're talking about. Here's a 21st century way to follow Jesus. First, prayerfully find a friend or two. Then, together, love the people around you. Then make friends with them. Over time, share stories about your faith with them. When people are ready, form a new Christian community where you are. I said this was a 21st century way to follow Jesus. Actually, it's not new at all. It's a first century recipe. When Jesus sent his disciples to the towns and villages, they went in pairs. He didn't send them on their own. He told them first to heal the sick, to love people. As they did, they would have made friends with them. Having made friends with them, they announced the kingdom. In other words, they shared their faith in Jesus with their new friends. After the disciples left each place, some people would have kept meeting together to prepare for Jesus' arrival. That's why the disciples went out in the first place. When Jesus came, he had a huge impact on people. It's very likely that those who'd responded positively to him continued to meet, as well as going to the synagogue. They would have met to encourage each other to keep following Jesus and building his kingdom. Following Jesus, as God send describes, is what Jesus taught his disciples. His first century way was appropriate to his context, and the 21st century approach fits ours today. Hi everyone, it's Ben here. Um, the biggest thing to come from the Kairos Connection conference for me um, actually comes from Brian Saunders. He's a guy that is part of the Underground Project uh, over in America. And it's definitely worth Googling if you haven't heard their story. But he says, the church is meant to be renewed and refreshed with every generation. Um, and that's really got me thinking. And that's how can we, how can we do that? How can we renew and refresh the church um, for the younger generations? Um, generation X, Generation Z, um, even down to Generation Alpha. Um, so yeah, it's, that's the biggest thing. I'm praying about it and not sure what that looks like at the moment. But I am really excited to see what God does with that and, and what direction God takes us in. Hi there. Um, to become the church that Jesus died for, we need a seismic change in our practice and thinking, and we need a new breed of pioneers to blaze a trail. Um, I've wanted to be part of that movement for a long time, but struggled to find some fellow travellers. Um, this conference was great for me because it affirmed what we've actually been doing, or better said, what God's been doing amongst us. And here are three main takeaways. 
plant small. It's okay if it's just two, two people, you and one other. Um, and you'll pick other people up along the way because vision is better caught than taught. Number two, we can get strung up about denominations. It may transpire you've got a Christian friend who's not from your church um, and they're up for the adventure. Is that messy? Yeah, it can be, but we need to trust the Holy Spirit. The main focus is not about growing our denominations, but the question should be, are these people growing in Christ-likeness? When we do something frightening, the Holy Spirit always shows up. And three, sometimes we can get strung up about conversion. Um, what we do is we begin a discipleship journey with people. We're all disciples because we're all learning together. The Bible is the teacher. And along the way, yeah, the Holy Spirit may convert people. It may be a thunderbolt kind of conversion or it may be imperceptible micro changes in someone's heart. But once again, we need to leave it down to the Holy Spirit. Some of the things I took home from the Kairos Connections community of practice were that it's encouraging to come together to see Jesus using so many great people to build his church. And it's fantastic that we are part of that. It's reaffirming that living as a missional church is so fruitful, but it's important to expand our thinking and the conference enables us and inspires us to look ahead. So it's exciting to look towards planting micro churches and thinking how we could come together to help pioneer that. One of the chorus moments that struck me was how do I share my decision of faith? And that's something I'm looking forward to bringing back to my missional community. But perhaps the biggest single takeaway was that simple things really do multiply. From having a cup of coffee with a co-worker and sharing your faith, great things can happen. And it was uplifting to hear some stories from other churches where micro churches have been so fruitful by doing just that. It's always good to have our thinking stimulated by the experience of other people. And uh, thank you for sharing those reflections. Um, and that stimulation is what we always get from being part of the Kairos Connection. Um, and it's great to be able to share it as a team too, even when we can't actually enjoy a meal around a table like we might normally do. If you remember the three R's that we shared at the beginning of the year, um, we'll be using some of the thinking that we gained on that community of practice to press on with those. That's raising missionary disciples, releasing the emerging generation and reimagining the church. You see, at the heart of this is because of Jesus, we know that we're loved by God, we're set free from guilt and shame and there's real hope for the future. And wouldn't it be great to be even better at sharing this good news with people around us and people we haven't met yet? That's what we're hoping and praying for. Good morning. This morning we continue with our studies in Paul's first letter to the church at Thessalonica, and we're still in chapter 4. Each week we've been encouraged by Paul's words to this young and persecuted church. We are learning from his advice to them how we can be a loving and outward looking church in these days. It seems to me that this section of chapter 4, entitled Living to Please God, divides into three parts. Last week, Jean explained the first part, verses 1 to 8, and these verses dealt with our moral and sexual relationships. But this week, entitled Living a Life of Love, we're looking at verses 9 to 12. I'm going to read these verses now, and I do hope you will turn it up in your own Bibles and keep it open as we think about it. It's a great help to me. So, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 9. Now about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. In fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more. To make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, you should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now verse 3 in this chapter gives the readers a challenge and it's the key to everything that Paul says in the verses we've just read. Verse 3 says, It is God's will that you should be sanctified. 
God wants us to be holy, and this is an ongoing work in us. Last week, it was moral and sexual holiness. This week, it's about our attitude to others and to our work or occupation. Don't you just love the way Paul writes here? He always commends them for what they're doing first, and then he encourages them to keep on, keep on loving, keep on working. Can you see where he does this? In verse 1, for example, he says, We instructed you how to live in order to please God, as you are in fact living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord, Lord Jesus to do this more and more. And in our passage today, he says, You do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia, yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more. This is not just about sanctification, but it's about growth. We are going to grow more holy day by day. And how do we do it? By our love for one another, lived out in our daily lives. Sanctified living was a common theme in Paul's letters, of course. And in his letter to Titus, just a few pages further on in the New Testament, he spells out the reason. Why should we? Be trying to live holy lives. I'm going to read a few verses from the letter to Titus, chapter 2, starting at verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all, all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. So there we have it. Why should we be trying more and more to live sanctified lives? Because God's grace has saved us. We have before us a blessed and sure hope, the reappearing of our Lord Jesus. In gratitude then for the priceless gift of salvation and in the sure hope of a glorious future with Jesus, we should be trying more and more, as Paul tells the Thessalonians, to live lives that please God. The first section of today's passage talks about loving others. Paul says that the Holy Spirit was working in them. He says that they've been taught by God to love each other. That's verse 9. Yes, God had taught them in the Old Testament to love their neighbour as themselves. Yes, Jesus had taught those around him and shown them by his example to love each other. But here, Paul is referring to the Spirit's work in them. And that will be true for us too. It will be the Holy Spirit who will prompt us to show love for others. The Holy Spirit who will remind us to look out for our neighbour and inspire our imagination as to how we can show love. Notice too that the Thessalonian Christians looked outside their own community and were showing their love to other believers throughout the whole of the country of Macedonia. How should that prompt us to look beyond our community and our country? How can we actually show love to believers in dire situations today around the world? We can pray earnestly for them, and this is very important, but we can also support them through organisations like our Mission Focus this month, Tear Fund. The folk at Tear Fund would love to send you information or email you prayer points for special needs at any time. Our brethren in so many places are severely persecuted. If you join the mailing list of an organisation like Barnabas Fund, they will show you how you can demonstrate your love for others, both by prayer and in financial support. We are to love and support our church family here in Deal, our neighbours wherever they are, and our international brothers and sisters. 
Another way of showing love for God and others is in our attitude to our daily work or occupation. And this forms the second part of today's verses. It seems some of the Thessalonian Christians had given up their day jobs in evident expectation of the imminent return of Jesus in glory. Because they were no longer busy with their own business, they had become busy bodies and they were interfering in other people's business. This part of our passage is culturally linked to the attitudes to work in Paul's day. The Greeks despised manual net labor. So the Christian's lifestyle was a counterculture clash, as one commentator put it, a counterculture clash. This new religion worshiped somebody who in his human life had been a carpenter. Paul, who had been a highly esteemed rabbi before his conversion and who could have devoted his life to academia, so to speak, as an evangelist supported himself as a tent maker. This was a hard, dirty and smelly job. These two examples of Jesus and Paul and the fishermen disciples gave dignity in Christ to all human labor. So Paul here in verses 10, 11 and 12 is urging the Thessalonians to lead daily lives that would win the respect of outsiders and that would make them not dependent on anyone else. For us, this may not mean working physically with our hands. It is important to notice here also that we have no freedom to apply Paul's teaching to, about work to the unwaged who are drawing unemployment benefits or perhaps living on welfare benefit. The contemporary problem of unemployment exacerbated by the pandemic is both a symptom of economic recession and traumatic personal experience. What Paul is condemning here is not unemployment as such, when work isn't, people want to work but there's no work available, but idleness, when work is available but people don't want it. He's emphasizing that we should be keen to earn our own living in order to support ourselves and our dependents and so not need to rely on others. True, it's an expression of love to support others who are in need, but it's also an expression of love to support ourselves so as not to, to need to be supported by others. In this time of the pandemic, so many are in real need and showing love to them is to be aware of the need and how we can help. The word to us, ourselves, is to use our precious time wisely as an act of love for our Lord and for others. As a retired person, perhaps temporarily, this speaks powerfully to me. Living a life of love in order to please God will be a very personal response depending on our circumstances. Well, I must stop. There are just two things I hope we can take away from today's passage. First of all, the first thing, it's a call to unselfishness. We are to please God and to love one another. Christian living is not primarily rules and regulations, it's relationships. The more we know and love God, the more we will want to please him. We need to develop a spiritual sensitivity to God through his word and the Holy Spirit so that in every situation we're able to ask ourselves, will it please him? On the other hand, love for others leads us to serve them. It's a liberating experience when the desire to please God overtakes the desire to please ourselves and when love for others displaces self-love. As one commentator put it, true freedom is not freedom from responsibility and God, to God and others in order to live for ourselves, but freedom from ourselves 
in order to live for God and others. I'll say that again. True freedom is not freedom from responsibility to God and others in order to live for ourselves, but freedom from ourselves in order to live for God and others. So first, it was a call to unselfishness, while the second is a call to growth, which I mentioned earlier, the urging of Paul to these believers to love each other more and more to please God by living for him more and more. We can never be complacent, as Paul says in Philippians 3 and verse 14. We are to press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called us heavenwards in Christ Jesus. We are to press on. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're living in times which shock us daily. We feel buffeted by what is happening around us. We thank you for Paul's letter and we thank you for the Thessalonian Christians and their love for one another. They're seeking to please God. Please help us each day to ask ourselves, will this please God? And through your Holy Spirit, please show us how each of us in our own situation of work or occupation can love those around us and we ask it in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and for his glory's sake. Amen.
Snail divers and surface families this week, we have been looking for ways to show and express love in our homes and neighbourhoods, to our friends and in our families. As we join together in prayer now, we would like to share with you some of these encouragements. We invite you to join with us, to be still in the presence of God, and take some time for your own prayers and reflections. Let's pray. God, we look to you, to your creation, the things you have made, and your words you have given us. Help us not to be overwhelmed with our troubles, our losses, our sadness. Give us vision to see things like you do, to share your heart for others. God, we look to you. We see your fingerprints all around us. You are where our help comes from, our guidance, our assurance, our peace and our protection. Give us wisdom. Help us to remember to ask for your wisdom. You know just what to do. Help us to stop, to think, to ask, what would Jesus do? We will love you, Lord, our strength, when we feel we have no strength ourselves. We will love you, Lord, our shield, our protector. We will love you, Lord, our rock, our solid ground, our firm foundation. All our days, we will love you, God, through our difficult days and our joyful ones. Hallelujah, our God reigns. Help us to remember that we are loved and to share your love with others. Forever all our days, hallelujah. We give you our joyful praise. The heavens declare your glory. The skies proclaim the work of your hands. Amen. Stay the same through the ages. 
Thank you, everyone, who has contributed to our worship this morning, to uh, Grace and Suja and Gabriella. That was fantastic. Thank you so much for your singing and your actions there. Uh, Joy, Ben, Becca, Robbie, Lisa, and the tech team behind the scenes. Um, and uh, it's lovely to see the way that the Lord stitches things together. I don't, I don't know about you, but I really feel I've been in the presence of God as we've worshipped together this morning. And it's lovely to see various parts of what we put together come together uh, without us planning that. Um, so thank you, Lord, for being at work amongst us. Um, some of us are using the next six weeks uh, in the uh, period of Lent preparation for Easter. Um, Christians over the centuries have used it as a time just to focus on growing in our relationship with God and preparing to celebrate the good news of Easter 
uh, when Jesus rose from the dead and, and embodied the hope uh, that uh, keeps us going. Uh, and it's great to know that some of our communities are using some resources. Uh, some are using uh, books, study books. Some are using some uh, video based stuff. Um, I love the, uh, the approach of the Wednesday congregation who've made the decision that they've been uh, asked to give up far too much this year already. So they're being very positive about taking things on uh, to uh, grow in relationship with God. Um, because Lent's not about beating ourselves up, it's about growing closer to God and becoming more like Jesus. Um, so maybe there are some good things that you could start to do uh, to bless others over the next weeks uh, or to uh, grow in your walk with God, or maybe just do that prayer walk that I encourage you to do a week or two ago around your area. And Robbie made a suggestion there too, that perhaps for some of us, engaging with some of our mission partners like Tear Fund or the Barnabas Fund and uh, praying and uh, supporting what brothers and sisters are doing around the world might be something new that we could take up to become just a bit more like Jesus. Um, uh, very practically, um, today is the day that uh, surfers, that's our uh, seven to 11 year olds are meeting on Zoom uh, this morning with Dan and Anka and Abby. So uh, that's at 12 today. So if you're a family, you should have the information about that. Don't miss it. It's great to keep in touch uh, with our children and for them to see each other. Uh, the prayer team have met this morning, as they always do, to pray. And this is one of those areas where I see God at work amongst us. Um, I mentioned the importance of thanksgiving. And uh, we talked about uh, trusting God this morning. Uh, and the two verses of scripture they came up were firstly from Psalm 34, verse 10, Psalm 34, verse 10, which says this, the lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord will lack no good thing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord will lack no good thing. And then from Philippians chapter four, verses six and seven, um, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Um, I think that's almost like a bit of signature scripture as we walk through the times we're in. Uh, don't be anxious. Pray with thanksgiving and God's peace, which is bigger than we can imagine, will guard our hearts and minds. So if you're feeling weak or without, uh, come back to God with it. Um, if you're anxious about things, pray over it, see God's peace. Um, and uh, Grace, uh, fantastic opening up of that parable on forgiveness. But if that's something you struggle with, um, be honest about that with God. Uh, you can't pretend before him. And if that's tough, tell him it's tough uh, and allow his grace to be at work in your life. Um, anyway, we're going to uh, say the grace together. Malta will put it up on the screen. But I just want to finish just by pausing before we do that and just being open to what God is doing and what he's been saying to us. And maybe it's just to thank him for being in his presence and of knowing that we are loved and accepted by him. Let's just pause in the quietness uh, for us to say whatever it is we need to say in our hearts to God. God, our Father, thank you for the love that you pour out on us and the love that you give us to share. And we pray for that freedom that Robbie talked about, freedom from ourselves, that we are able to love you and others around us. And we pray uh, today, tomorrow, into the weeks ahead, whatever we face, however things turn out in the world around us, 
that we might know your peace guarding our hearts and our minds. Make us thankful and joyful as we turn our hearts to you. And so let's join together and uh, use the words of the grace to pray for one another. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Thanks for joining with us this morning. Uh, if uh, you can, do click the, the heart, the like thing on YouTube because that makes our stuff more visible. And uh, God bless you as you go into the week. See you again soon. Bye.